Hello, everyone. Um, it's great to be back for another uh, Saito Community Town Hall. Uh, tonight, we I think we're about six weeks since the last one. Uh, we'll keep the regular format, although I think we'll we'll trim down a little bit on the update, partially because there's so much cool stuff happened, uh, to make a little bit more time today to talk about that in the question section. So for people who are new to the platform, uh, at the bottom of the screen, there's an ask a question uh, feature, and you can use that also to update. You can read through that and see anything you'd like answered and upvote any questions you'd like David and I to get onto. Um, and we'll do that. Um, saying David, I actually forgot to introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm Richard Paris, and this is David Lancashire. We're co founders at Saito. I'm not sure we always introduce ourselves properly on these. Um, and having said all of that, I'll get straight into things. Um, so as I said, it's been a pretty amazing probably month to six weeks since we last did one of these. Uh, we've been very busy. Uh, I think one of the key highlight banner moments was the release of the new website, uh, which actually coincides with a, with a wiki release that we did about a week before that. Um, and I think we're really proud of that for a bunch of reasons, one of which is we think it's uh, a new way and quite a fresh way to introduce Saito to people and to get them on the path to kind of grappling with the ideas and introduce them in a way that's interesting and, and enticing for people in a way that we haven't achieved before in a much more graphical way. Uh, we're also really proud of it because it was so heavily orchestrated by the community. So I don't know if people know, but uh, a couple of you know key community members, um, really did the heavy lifting they carried the project through and i think it also shows the that they took on the path of getting from knowing a bit about cider to really understanding the project and took people on that tried to take people on that, that path that journey with them so really proud of how involved the community have been with that part of the project and it's forming a template it's a bit of a theme tonight for how we move forward um so the wiki, the new website has some great animations, you know, video, and just a lot tighter presentation of our basic information. And it feeds back to a new wiki, which is becoming the central place for any kind of Saito information in more depth, uh, as well as places to find out what's going on and to learn how to participate and all of those sorts of things. Uh, and we really like that one too of, you know, the wiki for, for the kind of, dense in-depth content and a, and a you know, kind of very easy to navigate, open, uh, inviting website for people to come in and, and connect to. Um, along with that, we've had some you know, more great signs of community you know, activity, like the, a French white paper has been put out and we, we kind of blogged about that because it was, it was quite a nice um, little milestone for us. Um, and that sort of goes to show where things are moving with the, with the wiki being community editable, people can contribute, they can suggest things and actually push changes in um, for us to review. Um, and we're starting to see people taking up that, that kind of offer and really getting involved. Um, in terms of the project proper, so just moving on, uh, really huge things that happened. Uh, we've had three staff come on since the last um, since the last town hall and you know they're all developers and they've gone from new to the project to starting to put in some pretty impressive work on some pretty impressive features um we've also had the last of the vesting tranches for the private uh sale rounds which seed and private sale rounds which means we're in a really a new era for Saito where we're not um, dispersing any more of those tokens in earnest and so I think that's you know maybe something people want to ask a little bit about but that that really kind of puts us into a new phase with the project um and as I've said before what we're seeing as well is the amount of work that David and I are seeing happen and contributing to and kind of you know the new sort of new projects or initiatives starting off that are coming from community rather than project drive is, is also going up so we're finding as a team we're changing what we're doing to increasingly being involved with like working with community on stuff which is great um, in terms of software and, and the kind of stack we've had some really cool stuff happening uh, we pushed out settlers which is um, the first game to really take on poker head to head uh, in terms of its sort of transaction volume and impact on, on usage, which is great. We're getting really solid feedback for that. Um, I think everyone who's been watching has seen a real up in the level of polish and, and, and quality on the game since Dan Walton 
we're calling him the game doctor now because of the, this effect he's sort of brought to the you know everything up to up a level or two and that's been great at the same time we've seen some things like really exciting new kind of adventure into using the technologies behind basically things like this podcast the in web browser live stream back end web rtc stun and that sort of thing to add some new quicker features around moving transactions around but also the ability moving forward to add things like video feeds and stuff and that that stuff's coming from new developers which is really heartening um we've got uh we're getting very, very close to, to looking at the, the kind of MISI integration, the Web3 integration we've talked about before with adding cryptos to the site and expect some announcements around that soon. And then we're also seeing uptake on a couple of projects around uh, the biggest one we're seeing at the moment is people ask, asking and starting to participate in working on a Twitter-like interface, uh, Twitter clone type application to get some more social stuff happening on the network. So that's really a kind of whirlwind tour of the last six weeks. Um, so much has gone on. So I think uh, I might just throw to David to see if he has anything to add and we'll start bringing up the questions and uh, getting into getting stuck into those. Um, David, I think, are you muted? I'm not hearing you. <laughs> yeah, that was totally intentional. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, add, you know, like Richard's gone over, there's a ton of stuff I don't think you guys know about yet that's going to come out. Um, a lot of our focus is the application layer. We've got two devs working full time on porting Rust for Wasm as well. So we've got mm -hmm. the back end stuff and the front end stuff happening. I think as in our roadmap, the stuff that you guys will be seeing for the next two to three months will be heavily on the front end. Um, and it's exciting. Uh, for me, I think one of the things that's maybe hard for people in the community to see, but that's a really big deal for us is, you know, bringing more devs on and being able to change the way we're doing development. Um, and maybe I'll just say briefly about this, uh, you know, like we see people on Telegram where we put up the website and then people are like, oh, do this, you know, do this. And there are all these suggestions and, you know, we don't get them done in 48 hours. It's not necessarily because we don't agree. It's because we're actually working on so many things now that we got to have a process for it. Um, so yeah, and so like getting Carl involved and Carl's getting more active in, you know, helping us keep track of the suggestions people have and how we're implementing them. Um, you know, like whether it's Dan working on things or me working on things or Victor working on things, um, we're able to make more progress in part because we're getting these processes into place. And I think for me, that's the biggest change um but you know it's not visible to people but i think richard you might agree to me this is the biggest yeah. shift in the last i think year. it's i think it's a huge it's it's been a huge change and it, it it doesn't you know you don't sit down and decide to do it one day it's it's in response to it being appropriate and necessary um and like you said it's it's um it's come about because we've got more people working on more things mm -hmm. and we're trying to coordinate and make it more possible for you know, yeah. the parties to come in and do that as well. And I think one of the things that, that happens there that people, you know, don't really see is it's the classic, it's a, a classic trade-off problem. You know, David and I have worked on stuff from, from first days could often go in and do something reasonably quickly, but we really shouldn't be doing that. We should be finding someone, helping them to learn how to do that getting them the resources they need and making sure we have a system for like catching the energy and uh, capabilities that are coming into mm. the project. So, um, I mean, for me, that's just really a great, um, it's, it's a big shift. Yeah. And it, it's something we've been looking forward to. I think it's, it's like a great sign of us mm. going up a, a, up a level as a, as a project. Mm. Anyway, um, I mean, why don't we, why don't we deal with specific stuff and questions? If you've got them, there's that question tab. Um, yeah, let's just let's just get going. Let's just you guys talk into them. That one ask about. Cool. So top one I'm seeing is oops, I'll just hit start answering on that. Um, do we do any activities to increase transaction volume apart from the arcade? Um, I think we've been talking actually quite a bit about this this recently. Mm. Um, one of the big things we're doing is is looking into. Um, the abilities we get with working more with a web rtc and building kind of communication clients both because they will help the arcade and also because they'll be pretty compelling 
but uh, in themselves in that, you know, one of the big problems with things like video chat and stuff is that you always end up needing to use a third party provider to get you connected to other people. So mm -hmm. even with end to end encryption, you're go, you know, you're beholden to telegram or WhatsApp or whoever's running this thing. Uh, and so obvious, really big win for web three is things like video calls, which with no intermediaries, you know, all you need is a key and you can find someone anywhere on the internet and, yeah. and start a conversation with them. Um, so we are very aware of things like that. And I'm not sure people are, are aware of, of some other project with built in collaboration that maybe haven't taken off the ground, but things where we've built, you know, um, more business type applications and stuff. So we certainly have, um, the arcade is, is, is front and foremost to my mind because it's a, it's approachable, uh, and it's a very easy way to have people understand what we're doing and how, how the project's different. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll add something. Um, yep. I think we're, if you look at what, when we moved and we put the rust, uh, the network up and the upgrade there, um, if you're looking carefully, you could see a lot of changes. Uh, some of that's us testing things out. Like we tried to revamp the forum. Um, the forum doesn't work. Uh, I look at it. I'm not happy. There's not a lot of, there's not a huge amount of activity. Like it's way better mm. than it used to be, but it True. still kind of sucks, you know? Um, it's, this is actually one of the harder things I think for us dev wise as a project is it's super easy to have devs go and say, well, I fixed the forum because they fixed the way a button looks, but it doesn't mean that people want to use it. So, um, you know, with that upgrade, we made a bunch of changes and we were experimenting. Um, we're kind of constantly doing this or trying to. So like Richard said, over the last couple of weeks, we've been thinking, and one of the things we've been thinking about is like with the strategic direction of the arcade, um, like the dev center, you can look at the wallet, the wallet's totally changed. That's becoming a dev center, um, uh, in preparation for me and that stuff. But with the arcade itself, it's also, do we want a site where <coughs> like for it to work, we need to have people sitting there with a tab open waiting to take games. And so we're looking at changes there that are better able to kind of keep it from, make it a hub, but also make it something that reaches out into people's lives otherwise and kind of brings them in. So tournaments and leagues, leaderboards, ratings, uh, the ability to kind of publish something on Twitter that says, I'm looking for a game of Twilight Imperium or poker Wednesday evening, uh, which my friends want to sign up. Dan's been doing a lot of work on kind of uh, simpler ways to get people to join, link sharing, that sort of thing. So I'd say the answer is that we're always looking at ways to increase transaction volume. And I think the challenge for us as a community is not getting locked into, you know, because like we'll say, well, this is our strategy. And I think then people get locked into the idea that this is not only what we have to do, but this is what's going to work. And I think for us, we're more kind of constantly looking at what's happening and we're trying to figure out like what works and what doesn't work. Um, so, you know, like the, the Twitter stuff, we've kind of pushed it forward a bit in part because like Richard and I are both looking at the community forum and we're like, well, I mean, who uses a forum these days? It's 2022. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, constantly asking questions. The, the arcade is still going to be the focus of uh, transaction growth in the short and midterm, simply because that's what people come to use. Um, maybe yeah. when we get the Twitter clone up, if activity switches over to that, we'll be like, arcade's great, but let's focus on this. But um, okay. yeah, you know, it's step by step looking and seeing what works in constant experimentation. Yeah. Um, I think I can take down answering that. I might grab the second mm -hmm. question down and answer the uh, buy side token. Uh, answer mm -hmm. yes we're adding we tried to avoid a sub menu on the main menu on the website but there's a couple of things that really deserve to be there like a, a white mm -hmm. paper link and a get token link etc mm -hmm. um that's coming where that's in review and should be out tomorrow so mm -hmm. yeah there are a few things like that where it's amazing through the process you don't spot it but when we went live we were like pretty quickly oh yeah we need to just quickly update that and the main hold up there was just a little bit of theming around the uh the menu so yep that's happening um did you want to pick a question and, and move on Dave? I, I can take the staking question i mean people yep. ask her that yep. <laughs> i get sort of passive aggressive sometimes on tg i think with it um <laughs> maybe you know when apy you know uh <laughs> maybe we can pull back and say look where are we on the roadmap because i think people get confused with this and you know, someone says something, and everyone's like, "That's that's it." 
Uh, we've just done the final vesting. That means we've given people tokens. Uh, this process is going to take about three months to four months to kind of bleed out normally. Um, so we're in era one for, I guess, the next four months. We'll see. Um, we have one or two people whose token tranches are being delayed for contract compliance reasons, but that should be sorted out. Um, so staking. Uh, <clears throat> what we've got is we're working on the back end on implementation, how exactly to do it. And I think we'll have something for you guys in about three weeks because the thing with staking is people think it's like a feature. And the problem with staking is it's not really a feature, like giving tokens to people. The problem is on a really scalable network, what kind of data structures we use to do it. So if you're a proof of stake network or something, you're using some kind of database and it's easier to set that up, but you've got the constraints of the database. We don't really want to be running databases because they're slow. And when we unwind the chain and then rewind the chain, you've got to undo the payments and redo the payments. <coughs> so we want to make sure that we're doing this stuff right. Um, we are working on things constantly. My guess is that we're on track for that and the staking is going to happen next era. So I don't think you can expect it within the next four months, but I think people can expect that the software that will be supporting it will be live by the first part of the next era and we'll be uh, doing it then. The real question for me is, uh, it, dep it depends on like the implementation and how confident we are in how it scales. Um, because we don't want to be thrown, we don't want everyone to be like, hey, I want to put all of my tokens in staking if we don't think it's the, if we're still testing stuff out. So when we say things like we might start with a high threshold on the amount of staking that we uh, allow, that's us basically saying we don't want 100,000 people staking at the same time right at the beginning. Um, but yeah, uh, I think anyone who's asking about that, read the roadmap, assume it's about three to four months to the end of the current era. We've still got the Web3 crypto stuff to come out. Um, and we've still got the token to get to what's basically zero inflation. Um, and I'm assuming we're going to notice when that happens uh, because, you know, anyone can take a look at Etherscan and see that, uh, you know, we've got some new tokens out. Some people are selling, other people are holding. It's, uh, yeah. it's actually really interesting, I find. Richard? Yeah, so I think to add a little bit to that kind of from that vesting and state of the finances perspective, there's a lot of projects out there for whom staking is simply write your name in a, you know, it's a fancy version of write your name mm -hmm. in a spreadsheet, prove you've got some tokens and we'll give you more. And so it's deflationary mm -hmm. overall for the network. So in a situation where that's all that's happening, you, you mean people who, sorry, inflationary. Um, yeah. the, yes, um, what's happening is the people who bother to put their name in the spreadsheet get, have a slightly increasing value and people who don't, their tokens lose value. Yeah. Um, we're not doing that. We're not staking for the purpose of rewarding people just for being there because it's an attractive thing yeah. and it makes people think the project's interesting. We're doing it because it's an integral part. It's a backstop against the very last edge attacks on the golden ticket system with yeah. insider and so we're not doing it to, to you know we're not withholding staking for some like project-based reason or something mm -hmm. it's because we need to make sure that that piece of the whole mechanism is in place and in a way that doesn't make running nodes fiendishly complicated or doesn't put a tax on the whole system for or that when know, the staking this... table resets we can't have it take 10 minutes to reset. Yeah. Um, you know, like it's kind of computer science optimization things that people don't think about, right? Like yeah. we need the simplest fastest versions of these things. We need to be testing them under load. Um, and, you know, another thing people don't realize too, maybe I'll just chip in on this too, is that like, yeah. you know, when staking happens, people don't really think about how it affects the incentive structure. And I think people approach Sato with, the attitude of like DeFi shitcoins, where like Richard said, it's it's a Ponzi scheme. People want to be staking because if they're not staking, they're losing money uh, because there's inflation happening everywhere. So mm -hmm. it's like a race. 
you know, as we do as we do staking, we've got some really interesting questions, which is why we need to be at zero token inflation. For instance, if people are staking by pulling money off of the ERC uh, twenty, well, that's inducing scarcity in the ERC twenty token. Mm -hmm. So, what does that mean? Um, you know, people will ask questions like, you know, is everyone going to move their tokens into into the network? Well, that might cause some problems for uh, the circulating ERC twenty tokens. So we're going to need to actually think about this stuff. Um, but likewise, because we'll be dealing with a reasonably scarce zero inflation token, it'll be a lot easier for us to manage. Um, but you know, now isn't the time. That's why in the roadmap, it's second era, because we can't even really be thinking about this stuff now. Um, and I think we see that, you know, like people walk into Telegram and when they ask about staking, they're approaching Sato like it's a DeFi Ponzi shitcoin. It's like, well, they'll learn. Um, but, you know, we're a proper blockchain and these are the things we need to think about. Okay. Um, that being said, we're, I think we're going to come out in three weeks or so, maybe sooner, with some thoughts that are more technical for people who are technically interested in what we think is the proper way to be implementing things. Um, because we've been testing various approaches with JavaScript and Rust. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got something that's quite good, actually. But um, that's not really protocol. That's more just like this is how we think is the, the optimal way of doing it. It does have some unexpected properties. It may be easier for everyone to stake than people are imagining. Yeah, Richard? That's, that, that's what, one of the things we're excited about. I think we've probably given that a good good going over so and we're starting to see some more questions come in so let me jump on this next one quickly because we were talking about that um yes is the quick answer so the question is uh will it will it, will we have um appropriate funding to keep us going through a bear market and the answer is yes and the way we can be confident about that is we haven't been splashing money around we we are cautious we've brought on good developers you know um in a reasonable manner uh, so far and we've also concentrated on building community uh and getting a marketing and outreach strategy going that that grows itself that that takes the, the strengths of the project to the people without us needing to just funnel money into the market so yes we're in a very very good position to to be growing uh irrespective of market conditions um and so I think I'm really confident moving forward. I'm not sure what the next two years have. You know, the only way you can be sure, sure the market will go one way is to be convinced that it'll go the other. So, um, but we're ready for whatever mm -hmm. happens. Uh, David, did you have anything to, to add to that one? Uh, Richard, this is this is Richard's magic. Uh, I still have no <laughs> idea how you've been. Every um, now and then he's it's... like, David, we're in really the product's in great financial condition. I'm like, what? Not that I'm <laughs> Cool. Should we hop on to the next one, the, the top one? What actually Yeah, sure. You, wanna, you want to take? You want me to take it? Uh, you, you probably finished okay. reading it while I was answering the last one, so you start now. I'll, I'll hop in. Okay. Uh, I mean, here's the question: People, a, a lot of people, it's like a theoretical question: Is the network ready for development? And the people that ask this overwhelmingly aren't developers themselves, right? It's kind of like there's this silver bullet moment where things happen. We have worked and we are continuing to work and be in contact with people who are building on blockchains or interested in it. <coughs> and, you know, one of the problems for us that we see with external devs is it's like if you do a startup and you're depending on a single external customer, it's really rough because you're multiplying your probability of failure with their probability of failure and, you know, uh, or your probability of success by their, you know, and it 50%, 50%, well, you've now got 25% success. We are not following a development roadmap that puts the success of Sado in the hands of other people. So external developers, we love them. We are working to make it much easier for them to build on Sado, but we're not trying to, it would be negative for us to be in a trap of saying, look, we're building the software and you guys, these other people should build on it. And I think we actually see that in a lot of other blockchains. Um, and it ends up like that they end up having to do lots of big community funds to basically bribe people to build on the network. Um, the, 
we're building on it. So there are two things maybe I'll, I'll say that I think are important. The first is where we've seen people who are interested in building on Sado, it's a lot of it is because they see the excitement in the community and they see the applications we're doing and they realize that what they're doing can plug in and find a community, right? Like if you're putting up an NFT store or something or a, you're offering a crypto trading service, the ability to stick it into the arcade and the forum and Sado Twitter or whatever else that is, uh, it's a way of finding an audience. So our community is a huge strength here. Um, the second things in terms of development is it's not necessarily clear to a lot of people what, why you would want to build on Sado if their mind is in this DeFi space. Because people who are like external blockchain developers, they don't immediately think that the blockchain is a PKI network. So they're like, where are the smart contracts? Or how do I set up and create a token? And Sado is not useful for that yet. Um, what Sado is useful for, the kind of development that it's going to be useful for, is like if you want to accept Bitcoin payments and you've got an in-browser uh, service that uses a smart contract or something. So for those kind of use cases, Sado is pretty close. And I think the Web3 crypto is going to make huge strides in showing people why you'd want to do that. For people whose idea is, well, blockchain is about creating a token and unleashing some like token economics, we're not going to be ready for that for some time. Um, in terms of the Web3 crypto stuff, I think we need to lead in showing people this is, this is what you do and this is what you can do. Um, and that's why in the roadmap now we're like, we're dog fooding, we're producing apps uh, and we're building ourselves. Um, because part of that's also that you know, we can't ask developers to build on a platform we're not developing on because, you know, otherwise it's it's far too easy to kind of give people something that's uh, difficult to work on. Richard? Yeah, I think, I think that's also just to say, like some of the pragmatics we were talking before about getting better about working with, you know, enabling our own team and people who are coming along and participating. And no small part of what we're, like attending to there is observing people coming and it's you know wanting to work on Sado and, and take kind of using it as an opportunity to take a list of of what they need what we what we have in place already uh, you know from install instructions and SDK type stuff through to tools and so forth and just to get a really good understanding of what it's what it's going to make that a really pleasant experience. Um, that's also informed things like the way we're moving forward with Rust, because what that should do is give us a nice WASM library of the core mm. functionality for the blockchain that yeah. developers can use. So we are doing a lot to kind of up our game in that. And a lot of the things we're doing at the moment, that's one of the side effects is we're more than taking notes, um, but you know, kind of following along the process of like, as people start to set up their own project, what what's in it, what what's, involved and how do we help catalyze that? I think that's kind of a, a term we've hit on is how do we catalyze development on site instead of trying to drive it ourselves? And that's a shift we're going through at the moment. Cool. Um, there's a couple of interesting questions coming out, David. I think Rob's question, we kind of just answered that. The answer is that like, yeah. yes, but to different degrees of seriousness. Um, mm -hmm. The problem with the private sector stuff is a lot of organizations they're looking for smart contracts. So like an example I'll give is we chatted with one group in Beijing ages ago, two years ago, they mm -hmm. were, this is before COVID, oh, yeah. you could have meetings in Beijing and they yeah. were doing like, they were doing pork supply chain stuff, but they, they thought they needed a smart contract, you know? And so we go to them, we're like, well, why do you want a smart contract? And they don't need a smart contract, but their blockchain people are looking for smart contracts. Um, so you have some things like that where it's a lot of effort to kind of, you know, you need to hold their hands mm. and the people that are more likely to take the leap of faith are the least likely to be able to independently execute. Um, and so we kind of, you know, that kind of stuff comes up occasionally and we have to evaluate to what extent do we want to be putting our own resources in building a business for someone else? And the answer is usually that it's not a terribly high priority. Um, we are trying to get stuff moving so that we can get support to useful projects through things like ecosystem funds. Um, but we don't have anything substantive to announce on that yet. But yeah. 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 So I think people aren't necessarily aware of how much of that sort of thing has happened in the past and is on ongoing. Um, 
but yeah, as David says, it's it's a matter of where the priorities are and, and exactly what people are wanting to build. We are seeing more and more people coming to us with interesting things that will work and are, and are worth pursuing, you know, NFT trading, those kind of yeah. things that, that, that could really take off. So it, yeah, watch this space. Yeah. Um, oh, Richard, events. Uh, you take the listing question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I can take the listing question. Uh, it's it's a bit low down. Uh, I've I've clicked on on events, so maybe we go go that one. Then yeah. I'll take the listing question. I'd love to be going to events. I'm I just got out of home isolation <laughs> today, so um, we really would like to. We're pushing for connect uh, interesting places to to talk. I've been to. You know, quite a few blockchain events through 18, 19. And yeah, they're very, they're very patchy depending on whether they're worth attending or not. A lot of them are paid to play to stand in front of a big audience mm -hmm. and expect you to have a roadshow of, of, of stuff to pump at them and s try and sell. Um, mm -hmm. So we're very keen. Uh, if you've got any leads, let us know. But we're looking obviously at places where future side of community will be congregated and where we can get the message to them in a, in a, you know, useful format. So I think, you know, we're hoping to be able to be out and about a bit more in the coming year as things clear up with COVID and it becomes yeah. more possible. And we're always happy to do online. Um, and then I think hackathons to me are tied into what we were just saying. They're kind of a part of, you know, they'll be good for doing things like trialing SDKs. I think it's the first time they'll be really worth running where we can say, actually, let's have a competition to build something specific using the tools we've built and actually put them through their paces and learn from developers mm. as users in focus. If we're not doing something like that, then a hackathon is kind of one of often one of the, you know, ideas that marketing people go to in their bag of things I should do because I work for a blockchain project. I've um, never I've never got the hackathon concept, you know? Like as a dev, it feels exploitative and kind of shitty. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, great idea. Uh, you know, some VC fund funder company wants me to go and spend 24 hours building stuff for them so that maybe they'll throw a bit of cash my way. Like, I, you know, the thing I like about Ethereum and the smart contract is their approach wasn't, hey, let's have a bunch of hackathons. Their approach was, here's our website. Here's how to literally deploy a smart contract. And here's some things you can do with it. Have fun. Um, I think it's a better approach. Uh, yeah, anyway, um, I'm looking forward yes. to the Stanford blockchain conference. I'm hoping we can both make it. Oh, man, I think that would be great. Be, that would be great. Um, yeah. Yeah, those, that, those sort of those sort of places. Uh, actually, the economy, uh, the last time we were at that was pretty good. But there's, I've also been to like the AC, AIBC conference and it really mm -hmm. isn't, you know, I didn't feel we got value from attending that. So very interested. Let us know if there's any leads. This, this is my mm -hmm. main answer. Um, I can hop into the, the CEX question. Uh, we get it kind of every, uh, probably every um, town hall. So basically, it's an update on where we are. Um, mm. And we've had we've serious in-depth discussions and essentially have prices from a number of exchanges. This coming era, at some point, we're looking at mm -hmm. executing on one of those. Uh, and what we've seen, and it matches what we've been saying, is that, you know, by and large, I won't mention any exchanges on, on a forum like this, but, you know, a lot of them are expecting that you come to play the game, you play the game with them, and you grab some tokens, you exercise, you get some hype going, and then you dump on retail. Right? That's the game. That's that's what they're doing. And the project can make a, a lot of money, and the exchange make a lot of money out of that initial spike. And then you see if it lasts or if anything comes out of it. The purpose is for that initial spike and to take some money off the table as a pro project. We're just not interested in doing that. So one of the interesting things we have when we talk to exchanges is we have to explain to them we're, we're a long-term project with a long-term vision and a real duty of care felt for our community. Uh, and everyone who's come in and supported us thus far. So we're not going to execute that kind of thing. Um, that obviously isn't what they're often expecting. Um, and to Gates credit, they let us go our own way when we did the when we did the mm. listing with them by and large uh, and do things they've in a side done, of, side of way. They've also done really, really well, I think. From yeah, well. they, they, they got they got a reward from it. And they still get volume a year out, which most of the things that they listed yeah. in the week that they listed us don't yeah. do. Um, so it's just a matter of looking at, at, at who we go with. And we're also then, you know, obviously working connections and angles mm -hmm. and so forth to see if we can 
push down some of the pricing on that, et cetera. Because basically when we say price, what it is is how many coins are going to get dumped on retail. Like that's that's the the price of a listing. And that's why sometimes they generate value for existing holders and quite often they don't. So mm -hmm. we're, we're kind of comparing options and looking for the best way forward. Um, I can also say that we're continuing to do things around that space to, to look after community. So I had a great call today with a newish group um, who hopefully we'll be announcing a partnership with if things work out, if it makes sense, that will really help out US based uh, holders to have a better on and off ramps, etc. Just because we know that's become an issue given policy mm. changes at gate and other other holders. So mm. we do put time into this. And it's, it's always from a perspective of project health and community value from doing it. Mm. Um, and so yeah, I think we're in a place to execute kind of along the roadmap lines of when we said we would do that, which is, you know, coming months. But we want to make sure that that's something that actually has sustained value for everyone involved rather than yeah. a quick uh, pump that everyone gets excited about and then we're left you know with a decaying price and a, a disgruntled populace so that's my take david did you have anything to, to add uh yeah I, richard is closer to this stuff um i'm able to escape which is nice because <laughs> like when you chat with these people so many of them like they're just shit coiners you know like and I actually don't know how realistic people's expectations are with CXs. I'm a lot more skeptical. Like if you look at any of these exchanges uh, and you look at the coins that they're listing, it's just a total clusterfuck. Like every day they're listing this, they're listing that. And then you go and you see the price performance of these things and it's total garbage. Um, I, I've been surprised by how good we've been with the decentralized exchanges. And I think one of the really nice things about them is the community really is benefiting from liquidity provision. So, um, you know, I think on the roadmap, we targeted that next era is middle of next era, beginning of next era, wherever it is, is when we'll take a look and we'll be like, well, you know, we should get more exchanges on there. Um, I'm not feeling any pressure until then, unless it's like a really soft market and we look and people are having difficulty buying. Um, mostly, you know, and partly it's because I think the community is benefiting. And two, it's like, I actually think we're on a roadmap where all of these guys are going to be listing us and coming to us and coming to you guys to buy the tokens. Mm. Um, you know, we continue executing and growing the way we're doing. We've got, mm. we've got what, like 20,000 holders. Um, mm. You know, you look at projects like Cardano and, you know, TerraCoin or whatever, all of these things that people, I don't even think they're in our league, but you know, they're 200,000 holders or 300,000 holders or whatever. Um, you know, I think we can afford to wait. I've noticed that, you know, from chatting with Richard, that the prices, prices are getting better. Um, and, yeah. you know, uh, it's a it's a money decision for them, too. So I think yeah. focus on execution. If we get a good deal, we'll take it. If we don't get a good yeah. deal, I think we can afford to wait. Um, but yeah, I'm not as uh, I'm not as bought into the idea that the CEX is something that's even default good for the project. I think we do need a couple of them, um, and so I think you guys can expect that we'll deliver on what we said. Um, but yeah. I I don't think that we feel rushed. I, I certainly don't yeah. feel rushed. Well, I think that's that's the thing to kind of also just quickly say as well as I'm not sure people realize like the different pieces of the puzzle you're trying to put together from the can people participate in the project seat uh, in terms of tokens? So, mm. you know, there's obviously, is there any way of buying and selling? Well, you can set that up with Uniswap, et cetera, but then there's, mm. are there affordable ways that suit the different people who might want to be part of the community in different price brackets? You know, like one of the reasons we did pancake swap is to make sure there are affordable D, uh, DX yeah. options for people. Yeah. Then you've got to think, well, what about people in different jurisdictions? Like I mentioned, the US is difficult at the moment to get people yeah. access and to give them liquidity when they have it. And then there's things like you want to make sure you've got OTC desks mm -hmm. and then capacity for family offices and things because you want people, really big people, to become able to come in and take a large amount of, out of mm -hmm. out of circulation. I mean, there's nothing going to move the price like that. You know, it's going to be better for the project long term in terms of um, yeah. price discovery than that. So. Um, 
you know, we're, we're monitoring all those things. We're working on it. You know, there's a large, you know, black and yellow exchange. You can probably pay some enormous sum of money. And I've seen prices up, you know, past the million dollar mark where they, they will just do it for you. Um, not that they have no integrity. They do vet the projects, et cetera, but you can, you can push them with money. I don't think anyone would really benefit from a million dollars worth of cider being dropped into the market over a couple of week period. Um, long term no, i don't think long term it helps anybody so yeah. like i'm not even you know with exchanges also it's not even clear to me that we'll need to be giving them any sato mm -hmm. um, that's, know, that's, when people like that's... There, there are there are worlds where it's like well we're willing to pay you x but we're not going to give you a single sato um so mm -hmm. yeah we'll see and yeah. you know the i think the important thing for us maybe just is it's on the roadmap that's when we've said when we're going to be looking at it and dealing with it yeah. um you know, Gates changes have made it harder for people. We're aware of this. Uh, if it doesn't really cause problems to the project, it doesn't make something urgent for us. Um, if it does, then we can take a look at it. But I think right now buying time is actually really, really helping us and working in our favor mm -hmm. because we know, like we hear from people from exchanges and they're surprised because they don't understand Sato. Yeah. Like they, they're like, they look at the chart and they're like, and you guys can do this too. Like literally go back and look at the IDO or ICO charts of the tokens that are a year old, year and a half old, six months old. Theta is, it's in a league of its own. Like, uh, you know, we haven't done a hundred X or something, but compared to the other stuff, uh, we're moving up and to the right and everything else peaked, pump and dump, total crash. Um, you know, I think in terms of that for our project, that's great because that's being different and being obviously something that isn't a pump and dump over time is going to attract attention and curiosity. And that's what that's, you know, yeah. to me, that's why the price is important um, because yeah. it's pushing people to actually do the mental hard work of researching. And that's what gets people to the point where they're like, actually, wait a minute, these guys are right. And the entire crypto space is open. Like Sato can eat it. Yeah. So, yeah. Second, CEX. Cool. Yeah, we probably should. <laughs> I'm just looking at the number of questions that have come in now. We should probably move mm. a bit faster. Is there something you can see there, David? You'd like to get stuck into? Otherwise, um, I think we'll just do them one by one. The the ETH yeah. will Sato's growth rate be constrained by comparatively smaller profit opportunities? Um. I don't know. I mean, I kind of feel that it's like if we get the economics right, we have wind behind our back. And, mm -hmm. you know, like Joseph Campbell had that great quote where he said, you know, if you're doing the right thing, you'll find that doors will open for you that won't open for other people. And I don't know what that looks like. That might be a game developer comes along and says, you know, I'd like to put out a commercial game and hook it in with your Web3 crypto or you guys show advertisements and help me monetize this way. Like there could be something that's just weird. And it happens and that helps us. Um, so yeah, I think we're, we're not playing the same game as other people. Yeah. And I don't know what that means. I, yeah. that, that's kind know, of my response. Like people ask us and they're, you know, they ask us questions about what, what is it going to look like here in this Sado future world? And, you know, honestly, like we don't necessarily know any more than you guys. Like we're more familiar, I think Richard and I with swimming. Spend more time thinking about it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> But like, we can't tell you what 2026 looks like. We can, yeah. you know, it's a thought experiment. And the more people understand Seda, the more you can swim in it. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it was one of our early, early supporters, one of the first people to get what we were doing said like, what, what what's going to happen one day is we'll, we'll go along and look at monitoring and there'll be a bunch of transactions we can't account for. And some kids invented something on the network that we mm. hadn't anticipated, right? Yeah. Um, and I think to, to answer the question just a little bit more color to that, I think the kind of thing you're talking about here is exploiting a particular feature of the architecture mm -hmm. of ETH. And that's a thing. And right now people know how to make money by exploiting that feature of the architecture of ETH um, yeah. in this market doing this thing. We're hoping for something a lot more sustainable, which is you can build stuff that makes you money on side of because if you can get users, you can make money. Um, and that we have a full, like we say, real economy going on. So I kind of see what you're saying of like, are there any of these almost gotcha mm. moments in the architecture that you can exploit? And I'd say, I don't think so, but that doesn't, that doesn't worry me because I see much more of an open field and a benefit to having something that's really usable and can get a, a really big economy going. Yeah. Um, shall we move on to 
application. Uh, bridging, well, we, we run we run a bridge. Uh, so if you've got the ERC twenty, you want to convert it to mainnet. Maybe send plan. us an email. We're getting touch. We'll take care of it for you. With that being yeah. said, if you want to be playing around with tokens, uh, like we're happy to just give them to you. To be honest, um, you can keep your ERC twenty because the network's under development. Um, yeah. I, I don't think people necessarily understand exactly why. Like it's things like the transaction protocol and the block protocol and the UTXO protocol. We're kind of upgrading. Um, you know, Rust is developing. We're making some changes. We're kind of shrinking the size of the transactions. And you know, while we're doing that, we don't want to be we don't want to be locked into oh we've got to support some guy's seventeen cent, uh, seventeen cent, you know, tranche that's on chain. Uh, because it's going to slow down development. So, um, yeah, I mean, if you want the tokens on chain, send us a note. Um, if you're doing dev or something, we'll probably just give them to you and keep your tokens mm. on the year. We also have de we have dev nets running now as well, so we yeah. can we can happily give you, you know, access to that. If, if you know, with good. with that said, please also assume that we're busy. Um, you know, yeah. if you if people <laughs> like, you know, because there are people like, oh, hey, you know, I'm going to help running a node, and it's actually people don't realize that if you're running a node and you're not contributing value you're actually kind of civil attacking the network right because you're making it harder you're consuming bandwidth all of a sudden like uh it's useful for debugging and stuff but it's not always helpful um but yeah uh so if you want to move them over let us know uh, i think when staking happens we'll be much more public about exactly how to do it um, and one of the questions is like do we carve out a block reward for stakers um, but we can't make that decision yet for reasons we've talked about before. It's going to take, okay. you know, five six months. Cool. Richard, uh, yeah, I think I think that co that covers it from from mine. I actually marked the answer complete there. So uh, maybe let's move on to uh, ideas for applications mm -hmm. that will generate good TX because it's a nice fun thing to answer. Um, I think it's really broad. I th I see in the not too distant future things like IoT across something like Cyto as a PKI network taking off because they just get rid of the data center. And that's what everyone's complaint with IoT is like, why does someone in Shenzhen need to know the temperature in my apartment and what's in my fridge? Um, and that's a really great place for having devices be able to interact autonomously and securely across an, an open network. So it's things people may not be seeing now. Um, did you have a favorite kind of app for Cyto, David, that you've... I, I think that people can think of applications that will drive transaction volume pretty easily. Uh, one challenge is we have to be producing a neutral open platform. Um, mm -hmm. We can't be positioning Sato as a solution to one particular business or commercial use case. Um, mm -hmm. And that's in part to protect the openness of the platform. Um, but yeah, no, uh, I, I think there's a ton of things. Um, <laughs> I think, I think it's going to be iterative, right? Like we're, we're not coming out with silver bullet stuff. And we can see in Telegram that like one thing I've noticed, which it's it's sweet and frustrating, but also totally understandable that like sometimes we'll announce something and then instantly it's like the date that we're announcing this one tiny thing is like people are like, this is the date that mainnet is hitting. And it's like, well, like Web3 crypto is mainnet and, you know, something else is mainnet. <laughs> like it's like we don't even use the word mainnet. Um, fix the bug 7431 is main <laughs> yeah and you know like for us it's not there's it's there's no silver bullet which is the point where things flip um for me like i'm super amazed and pleased with what dan has been doing because one of the things i've seen is people have stopped getting frustrated at well i don't like this game and they've started to get frustrated at things like the initialization is too slow which tells you that the game is getting better people want to play it um, add the Web3 crypto, continue to improve things, add this Sato Twitter, get like leaderboards and ranking and scheduling. And, you know, step by step, everything we do to make it better makes everything else better. So, uh, you know, for me, it's this iterative process um, where the stuff that we've already done is getting better by virtue of the new things we're adding. And the new things, uh, you know, the new things that we're adding are useful and better because of the things we've built before. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the arcade use cases are building off what we've done uh, and building off the new features that are coming too. 
I'm curious about the social media stuff though, because I have no idea what to expect. Mm -hmm. Oh, been you. Like, you know, um, it, it's going to be hard to get chicken and egg in terms of engagement. One of the things I think about that, what I'm hoping we can do is get our actual dev community onto that. So that like, as we're devving data, we can start publishing screenshots and chat about what we're doing so that there's a reason for people to come. And there's kind of like a hub of activity already that we can build around. Yeah. So. Um, I kind of like answering uh, the idea of answering Keki's question about if there are any NDAs that we're under that we can't talk about by saying, if I said that I wasn't under an NDA, would you believe me? Um, the NDA canary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if that was even just a joke question from Keki. Mm -hmm. um, on Maya Dex, I can also say, yes, mm -hmm. I've spoken to the Maya team. And it's, that's something that, that we're looking into from both sides to find a, a good way to, to do that at some point, if it makes sense for the communities. So we, yeah. we have a, we have a connection to them and, and we've spoken about it. Um, I'm not sure when makes the most sense to, to kind of prioritize that over a lot of other things we're doing, but it is something we're aware there's a, there's a desire for. Uh, Elrond also, maybe by the same note, it's not going to be crypto one with integration, but it's a priority and we're working on it. Um, yeah. You know, that's one of the questions for us uh, is how to get various things integrated. We're actually uh, we're actually pulling some weight to help Elrond here, and we're hoping to share news of that as we can. Yeah. Cool. Um, start and finish that. Did you want to take the EVM question? I think someone's actually referring to the blockchains on yeah, blockchains. I mean, it's it's paper. kind of like it's just an L2 app. You know, it's like your wallet. Imagine if you installed an EVM in your wallet. And that EVM said, I don't care about every single transaction. I just care about the ones that are in the blocks that say they're for my EVM. So you could, you know, you can have your own rules for what transactions you're going to process in your EVM. You might pick an address on the network and say anything that's sent to this address, treat that as if it's an Ethereum transaction and my wallet will process Ethereum transactions. So the underlying security layer and the underlying payment layer and the underlying blockchain is running on the network and then the nodes on the network that run the evm are running it like an application uh, they they receive the blocks and those blocks have the transactions in them to process they don't need to process every transaction you might only have five transactions in a block you process but they're structured and they're ordered because they're coming to you in a blockchain that's structuring the transactions in blocks. So you can have a tiny, tiny EVM that 10 of your friends will, or you could have a massive EVM that Google, Baidu, and Amazon run nodes for, and they process and collect transactions on the Sado blockchain. They can have their own tokens. They can use the Sado token. Um, but you know, that's it. If you think about it this way, the real question is why would you ever do what Ethereum does, which is force every single node in the network to run the EVM? Like, why do you want the nodes that are producing blocks and validating transactions to have to maintain all of this complicated state? Let the nodes that want to do it, do it. So, um, you know, that's what an EVM, it would, it's an app. Uh, and I think the, the example I give is just like, think about Ethereum where you, separate the EVM so it runs in your wallet and whoever wants to run that EVM can, but if the people don't, they can still track uh, what's on the blockchain, what transactions have been made, and they can still participate in securing it and getting paid. Cool. You know? So, um, I think that know. actually, oh, did it, go on, okay. Like was, L2, L2, of time. L2 is kind of the same, you know, it's like, yeah, I was, I was, I think that answers both of those. Yeah. Yeah. It gives you the, the, the main sense of it. It's also one of the prime reasons you'd want to put an L2 inside of it is to have it run an EVM and be free to do that in isolation without the whole chain needing to, to be doing it all the time. Um, I might start off with this one and then hand mm -hmm. over to you, David. Um, the idea here is that uh, yeah, as the world is coming to see with these things, Rust is a really great language to build your core logic in. It's it's pain to get through it complaining, but when you do it solid and really well contained, etc. And the ability to give people the core include in whatever language they're using, that obviously starting with JavaScript, to say, 
include the think of it as like Sato basics, right? Sato core, like all the functionality to validate transactions, blocks, sign a message, all those sorts of things. So that if you're building a Sato app, you just get that's that's what you import, and then your job as a developer from there is saying, well, what does my application do? And when does it, whenever it needs to send a message, oh, I've got this API, I just take the payload, sign it, send a, an attach an appropriate fee and send it because that's all functions that are exposed from the uh, WASM. It obviously gets a little bit trickier than that because you've got bits and pieces around, well, depending on what language you're using and what your environment is, you'll have different access to things like storage. So browser you know wasn't in the browser is going to need another little buddy to say well we're in the browser this is what we can and can't do with storage versus i'm on a phone or i'm on a you know on a desktop with a particular operating system mm -hmm. um, but the idea there is basically so that you can have some stub projects out there for popular languages uh, and we're hoping the community is actually you know going to get behind this and start spreading it out wider as we get the pieces in place so well, here's a stub here's a stub application for ios here's a stub application for um for android for desktop or whatever and then people can see okay well this thing all it does is check you know for a message sent to it and then respond or something as a button um, but then people can very quickly take that and say, oh, okay, now I can write my, you know, my MVP, uh, business software or my game or my social app or whatever on top of this. And it's really obvious what I need to do. So that's, that's the kind of the dream. And it would basically be a bunch of a, a cup, you know, a couple of includes and some stub projects for each language just to help people get going. Yeah, um, if anyone has other questions about Wasm, I like I think we can we can go into technical detail about like what it is and why we're doing it uh, and timeline. But I think most people, it's a general question. I think that's a good yeah. answer. For it. I will yeah. say there is an SDK in JavaScript today. So if your people are willing to dev in JavaScript, mm. you've got the JavaScript SDK. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay, we've got a couple of couple of questions. Up. We've also only got a couple of minutes, so I'll, um, I'll quickly tackle Jeff, Jeff's, which is just you know, if anyone yeah. is interested in developing on Sado, we understand that it's hard, um, and we're able to offer help. So, one of the challenges with the community stuff is that you know people want to be building stuff and helping, um, and so like I, I've been putting in some time you know, with the Twitter stuff to help structure the app uh, and say, look, this is the stuff that, you know, we'll take care of. You can help if you can help with these pieces. Um, but yeah, I mean, if people are interested in developing, if it's serious, reach out to us and we'll we'll make sure you can, we'll, we'll help yeah. you get the app together. Um, yeah. We're not going to be able to do all of the heavy lifting, uh, design and branding and that sort of thing, but we can definitely help people make sure it works. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, get the basics in place so people can understand exactly how Sado development happens. Um, for that, reach out to us. Yeah, and and likewise, if you'd like things like space on the wiki to ask for, you know, to try and help build a group to do something yeah. or, you know, help getting messaging to the community that you're looking for assistance with building something on Sado, yeah. obviously happy to do that as, as well. You know, I'll also push like uh, a lot of times in the blockchain space, people are looking for partnerships and not focused on building code. It's really helpful for us if when you reach out, you have a sense of what you want to do. Like, I know what I want the app to look like, and I kind of already know how I design it um, because that's the fastest way to get things done. Um, the quick question is coming from, yeah, when should we use SQLite? And my answer is always, always really? use SQLite. I don't know why he's asking, but that's my simple answer to that question is every servers, time you can. I mean, Sado nodes have the option of using it. And if they don't support yeah. it, they, they'll fall through. So for us, some applications will store data in an SQL server if it's available yeah. and like browsers that yeah. don't. Although some browsers will be able to do it Electron and stuff. Um, yeah. They'll just, they just won't use that more, more and more. I that's a browser that's a design also. issue. That's a design yeah. issue for developers. Like if you're well, essentially Android, Android already does as well by default. That's like the what apps get to store data. So it's yeah. an interesting, interesting space. I was just being facetious previously. Mm -hmm. 
where do we see development in 2024? I think we were saying before, like, we're not really sure. One thing I can say for certain is there'll be a much broader church of people working on that because we can see that happening already. You know, lots of people coming in from from different spaces and, and looking to work on it. And it's been a thing we've been talking about much more today than in previous town halls. So to me, it'll be um, a, a much broader community with, with a lot more projects going on independently and, and, and more kind of, you know, and I don't think it will be too long before we see kind of maybe 2024 Stack Overflow Saito question and answer somewhere around there. So. I think the roadmap's pretty good. Hmm. Cool. Um, I think we've got two questions left. Maybe we maybe we cut or quickly answer these two and then, and then call that an evening because it's been a it's been a good good session. Yeah. Uh, do you want me to tackle the Twitter one? Yeah, go for it. You're more involved. So, so. Here's the thing. Um, we're not good at community involvement, and one of the reasons for that is that things are kind of changing and they're moving and they're happening so quickly that it's kind of hard in this instability to say look we want you to tackle this or it would be really helpful for instance we now that the website's done we're going back and we're going to be restyling the arcade and it's kind of hard to go to someone and say look the css for the arcade is going to totally change uh how about you build this this app which involves the design level stuff um, also, you know, ramping up staff, uh, and the fact that like Richard and I have been super busy, it's, I, it's not like holding people's hands, but there are people that want to help. And we have not been good about, uh, saying, look, here's how you can be super productive. That's something that we are working on. Um, and I've been trying to put more time into it. And it's also like team coordination stuff. Like we've got, we've got someone who submitted a, um, a pull request. And we haven't got it integrated because like Victor would take a look and then Victor runs into a problem and, you know, we're trying not to micromanage stuff. If you are interested in helping out, send an email to Carl or send an email to me. And I think what we're going to do is we're going to get like a, a private newsletter or something going for people, some way for information sharing where we can, uh, we, you know, we can share news on what's going on. Um, please don't do this if you're not interested in being a developer or helping out. But uh, that's probably the immediate way that we're going to be doing things. Um, I'm hoping, though, that we can get that sort of thing out within about a month and a half to two months. Because, you know, like, we work on the things that we think are important. Um, and it's great to have community assistance. So... Yeah. Like there, there may be things that aren't a priority for us, but that are a priority for someone else. And having someone be able to say, yeah, I can tackle that is, is so useful. Yeah. Richard, you want to take the Wasm stuff? I think it's yeah, so like Wasm is at risk of becoming one of these tech words that people are like, when, <laughs> and they yeah. don't understand really like, like yeah. why Wasm? It's because we, it's better if we just use one source code the Rust code to handle all of consensus instead of Rust and JavaScript. Yeah. And Rust is faster. Um, and yeah. we don't have strings. And it's more optimized. Uh, when do we expect it? I mean. Well, I think the question is what what part of it? So we're hoping to be testing a you know uh, Rust consensus wrapped in wasm, you know, in the reasonably quickly, like by the end of the you know, maybe this month or sometime, we'll start looking at that. Like, when does it, when does it connect? Um, the, yeah. the, the point is like, you know, it has to connect, it has to perform, it has to be better than the, the JavaScript core mm -hmm. code. And then it could swap that out. Then we need to start pressure testing it in all the different environments and so forth. So it's, it's sort of like, yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, well, mm -hmm. you know, um, when the what exactly when, is the when when what when, when, <laughs> but it's when moving. done <laughs> we need to rewrite the JavaScript light client because all of the core stuff that's handling blocks and the blockchains and JavaScript goes away and it's handled by Wasm so it's a it's a major major upgrade it's not going to be soon like we can have the Rust client support Wasm and it's still a year off so uh, yeah yeah it's not soon but it's the sort of thing that like now that we're redoing uh wasm <laughs> now that we're redoing now that we're redoing rust like it's an architectural thing it makes sense to do it 
figure out what the problems are and solve them because we know that we need to do this long term. So my guess is a year, um, maybe a year until we start the JavaScript like client re revamp, but we'll see. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, I think it was another really profitable session. Uh, and uh, we'll look to doing one you know, sort of the five, six week range again from now. Uh, in the interim, uh, we're always around on Telegram and things. Mm -hmm. Although you're seeing David and us are a little less there and, and um, community picking up a lot of, of Slack there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, do get in touch if anything is, is of interest and, and participate if you're uh, interested in, you know, like David said, contact us in the email or I dropped an actual link to the to the wiki in the uh questions there just to answer jeff quickly um we'll we'll get back to you and we're, we're you know we're always interested in what the community are up to and we've had some you know very good community suggestions and things recently so very exciting cool well thanks for all of your time and I think we're gonna sign off